Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Smithville Communications, serving Southern Indiana with high-speed fiber gigabit internet. Smithville Fiber Gigabit Technology, tap the power. And by WTIU members, thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. The debate over the Religious Freedom Restoration Act has quieted at the State House, but there's work to be done to repair the state's image. I wasn't sure how I would fit in and mesh with these people. As high school seniors decide where to go to college, Rifra and the fierce debate they watch play out on national news is foremost in some of their minds. Plus, few things illustrate Hoosier basketball history more than Assembly Hall. Most of this is, is from circa 1970 and is in need of some attention if it's going to be here for decades more. The arena is getting a makeover. Ahead, inside the more than $40 million renovations. Those stories plus the latest top headlines from across the state right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Indiana's Religious Freedom Restoration Act dominated headlines last week and garnered national media attention. In response to the law, corporations, organizations, and other state governments announced they wouldn't work with Indiana if the law remained intact. State Impact Indiana's Clara McInerney reports on how the portrayal of, national, of Indiana in national media affected the decisions of a more impressionable group of outsiders, high school seniors from other states considering Indiana colleges and universities. Almost every day this month, hundreds of prospective students will visit Indiana University's campus. They either just recently committed or are trying to get one last feel for the university before choosing a school by the May 1st deadline. Liam Dixon is one of those students taking an April campus tour. He applied to 18 universities and has spent the majority of his senior year at home in Irvine, California, trying to decide which one is the best fit for him. And recently, he settled on IU. It was probably a week or two ago, uh, but this is my first time visiting the campus. Around the same time he committed to IU, the news of Indiana's religious freedom bill reached Dixon in California, where he goes to school with openly gay students and lives in what he calls a very open-minded community. I didn't know how to really interpret hearing that they were being so uh, close-minded and conservative on this one specific topic. Dixon wasn't the only out-of-state student to question his decision about spending the next four years in Indiana after reading about the law. The IU admissions office received multiple calls and emails from out-of-state students and their families. These are families that have developed relationships with us and they've visited us many, many, many times. They've been engaged with us throughout their process and they just want to know that the experiences that they've had with Indiana University and Bloomington to date are going to be the same experiences that they can expect in the future. Timmy says although the timing of the commitment deadline and RIFRA was unfortunate, it helped engage prospective families with IU and learn even more about the university. We welcome families to ask questions. We welcome students to ask questions. We're an institution of higher education. We invite academic inquiry. IU wasn't the only university to engage in the RIFRA conversation. University presidents from Ball State, Butler, DePauw, as well as IU, all issued statements saying their schools accept all students and oppose the law. But for students already attending Indiana colleges, the legislation and reaction from those in and out of the state prompted another question. Is Indiana a state they want to work and live in after graduation? That's something IU sophomore and Kokomo native Morgan Moore is currently grappling with. Moore studies political science at IU, is interning on a mayoral campaign in Bloomington, and is considering law school. But after seeing the backlash from people around the country regarding RIFRA, 
She's worried about what her degree from IU will say about a potential political or law career. When Seattle and, for example, New York ban state travel for employees to come to Indiana on paid leave, I think that just shows that people across the nation are really concerned not just about some of our politicians, but about the state as a whole and about the attitudes of people in the state towards LGBT people and their potential for discrimination. Moore says she would like to stay in Indiana to pursue her career and wants to spend the rest of her college experience figuring out how she can contribute to Indiana rather than feel discouraged by it. For Dixon, his visit to IU changed his perception of the state that RIFRA created. He says as he walked around campus and saw signs promoting acceptance and talked with current students, he feels more excited about going to school there in the fall. I've definitely felt that people are more accepting here and there it doesn't seem like what went on in the in the, from the Capitol building or what like that's really being reflected down here at all in the students' mindsets. It seems like everyone's just a lot more kind of how the mindset is back in California where they just don't care. RIFRA is having another unintended consequence. Community leaders across the state are updating their local ordinances to prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation. Before the law was signed, about a dozen cities and towns had human rights ordinances that protected gays and lesbians from discrimination. This week, Muncie was added to, to that list after the city council passed an ordinance adding sexual identity to its human rights statute. Martinsville's mayor also issued an executive order this week prohibiting city departments from discriminating based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And the city council is working on a more permanent citywide human rights ordinance after an online petition asking the city to do so gained hundreds of signatures. Martinsville native Brent Kent started the petition. He says he's proud of his hometown for stepping up. Right now is an opportunity for every community to reinstate what's important. And Martinsville in particular really wants the outside world to know that they celebrate diversity and they want to be known for kindness and inclusivity. Other cities like Terre Haute are beefing up their existing laws. Terre Haute Human Relations Commission Executive Director Jeff Lorick says the city's human rights language has been in place since 1999 but it's insufficient. Terre Haute is in a unique position uh, as our ordinance stands. Uh, the Human Relations Commission office does not have enforcement powers or investigative power or subpoena power. If Terre Haute could issue fines or had the power to subpoena people when they're accused of discriminating, the people involved might be able to work out their issue before they get to court. Lorick says that would save the city and businesses money and make people feel more valued. Freedom Indiana, the group that leads the opposition to RIFRA, is working with cities to help them write or rewrite their human rights ordinances. The group says its ultimate goal is to have a statewide non-discrimination law in place by next year. Now for headlines, we go over to Alex Dierkman, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thank you, Joe. Proponents of a bill that would have opened up adoption records say they aren't giving up and plan to reignite the debate next year. The bill that stalled in committee would have allowed access to birth certificates for those who were adopted between 1941 and 1993, the period when Indiana sealed all adoption records. Opponents of the measure argue the bill would infringe on the privacy promised to mothers. Now, with less than a month before the session ends, legislators are bumping the bill to focus on other priorities. Senate leaders are proposing setting aside $2 million to help boost Indiana's image. The proposal comes in response to fears that the state's economy is taking a hit because of boycotts prompted by the religious freedom debate. The proposed Senate budget increases tourism funding by $1 million a year, so the state can market itself to companies as a good place to do business. The Senate still has to vote on a budget and reconcile it with the House's version. An energy efficiency plan intended to replace the now defunct Energizing Indiana program is on its way to the governor's desk. The Senate gave its final approval to a bill requiring electric utilities to submit conservation plans to the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission every three years. Proponents say going through the regulatory commission instead of an outside agency will be cheaper than energizing Indiana, which the legislature repealed last year. But environmental groups point out the bill does not mandate utilities conserve a set amount of energy. 
The Hoosier State Passenger Rail Line from Indianapolis to Chicago will continue to operate after the Indiana Department of Transportation reached an agreement with the Federal Railroad Administration. N new federal rules would have held the state liable for any mishaps on the line, but an INDOT spokesman says the line's contractors have agreed to take on that burden. The contracts will have uh, consequences for one type or another uh, to make sure that, that uh, all of the reporting, safety, ADA accessibility requirements are met. We'll also have someone on our staff that will be responsible for contract compliance, overseeing the work of the contractors, making sure that's done. Amtrak will keep managing the line indefinitely. This week marks the 25th anniversary of the death of Ryan White, the 18-year-old boy from Kokomo, Indiana, who became the face of HIV. White died in 1990 in Indianapolis, five years after contracting HIV during a blood transfusion. At the time, HIV was still a relatively new disease to most people, and those who contracted it were stigmatized. White's story, White's story inspired many, forcing people in Indiana and across the nation to confront their fears and misconceptions about HIV. But AIDS awareness advocates say the fight against the virus isn't over. People are more knowledgeable about the existence of HIV. However, you know, I'm concerned that um, with the advances in medicine, uh, people may not be as concerned about it as they were at one point in time. And I think that with the stories coming from Southern Indiana now, it's really brought to the forefront that while the treatment has improved, HIV is still the same virus that we were dealing with back then, and it's still a serious health issue. The HIV epidemic in southeastern Indiana has infected about 90 people. Turner says that's proof education is still needed, especially among rural and poorer populations that have limited access to health care. Get your dogs vaccinated for the flu. That's the advice of the Indiana State Board of Animal Health. The department is warning Hoosiers that cases of canine influenza, or H3N8, have been reported near Chicago. 50 to 80 percent of dogs exposed to the virus will show symptoms such as coughing, sneezing, lack of appetite and fever. And a small town police department is turning to the Internet to raise money for their dogs, in particular for a second canine unit. As Barbara Harrington reports, Winchester police say the dogs are their best tool in the fight against a growing drug problem. Life moves pretty slowly in the small town of Winchester. Just over 5,000 people live here, but thousands more pass through every week on state and federal highways. And some of them are driving a big problem into town. Right now, all these places are, are main drop-off points, main distribution points for heroin, marijuana, different things of that nature. Officer Brandon Barndoller spends much of his time patrolling the streets, hoping to catch drugs before they make their way into neighboring communities and states. He's been working with his four-legged partner, Leo, since 2013, playing a more sophisticated game of fetch. We'll, we'll place a training aid out, um, and then we'll let it sit here for a couple minutes, and uh, then I'll get Leo out and see if he can find him. Leo is trained to sniff out several different types of narcotics. During this exercise, he's picking up on the smell of heroin nestled in a truck's wheel well. A skilled barn dollar says has proven invaluable. If he sits on the car, which is the indication, and stares at the car, that tells me that he believes the odor of narcotics is coming from that car. And in that case, that gives me um, reasonable, uh, probable cause to search the vehicle at that point without having to get a warrant or anything. Leo helps with narcotics cases up to six times a day, in addition to his regular patrol work. Drug trafficking has become such a big problem in Winchester, the police department wants to get a second canine unit. I can't be available every day for 24 hours a day. Um, so to us, we see the increase in our overdoses. We see the increase in the drug use and crime in our area. Um, and one of the biggest tools that we have to combat that is a dog. Getting a second canine will cost the department about $20,000 up front. That's a large price tag considering they don't even have a budget for Leo. They rely on donations. And this time, they're asking people outside of the community to help through an online fundraiser on GoFundMe. It's not a problem just here. Uh, you know, it, it's a problem that if, if I stop a cartload of drugs that's going northbound on 27, 
I may have just saved Jay County or Allen County or somewhere like that from getting a load of dope in their city. The department still has about $13,000 to go before it reaches its goal. This is the best tool that we feel we have to be able to go get the, the drugs off the street and get the people who have them, get it out of their cars, get them trafficking it, and maybe potentially save a kid from getting stuck with a dirty needle. And Joe, you might have heard the officer using some interesting calls for his dog. He actually had to learn some of the commands in Czech, German, and Dutch. Ah, interesting. Well, and as we talk to mayors across the state, there's just not extra money. So an interesting use yeah. of the GoFundMe. Absolutely. So. It's very popular. Thanks, Alex. Yes. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Lawmakers are deciding how education dollars should be distributed and whether the state superintendent should head the State Board of Education. Our state impact team breaks down the debate. Assembly Hall is undergoing extensive renovations. We take you behind the scenes to learn what the arena will look like $35 million later. These stories, plus a look back at IU basketball history, right here on Indiana News Desk. PBS kicks off the weekend with Charlie Rose and America's top newsmakers on his new series, Charlie Rose, The Week. Some people say, well, you know, Obama was this raving liberal before, now he's you know, Dick Cheney. Recap the week's biggest stories and Charlie's best interviews. You feel there's this incredible synergy between the audience and, and the performer, and time slows down. And get a look at the week ahead. Charlie Rose, The Week. Check local listings. Frontline provides me with information that makes me think. First I shout at the television. You've got to be kidding! You won't see this anywhere else. The stories hit close to home. Truth is a very valuable commodity. They're uncompromising. I want to do something. I want to take action. It changed the way I actually live my life. It lets me make up my mind. I trust it. When I watch Frontline. It makes me angry and it makes me want to voice it. I want to make a difference. We can make a difference. Frontline. These guys are my heroes. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. As the so-called education session gets closer to an end, the General Assembly is finalizing a number of education bills to send to the governor's desk. One of the major decisions the legislature is debating is how the state funds school districts. Another is whether to keep Glenda Ritz the head of the State Board of Education. State Impact Indiana's Claire McInerney joins us now to explain more about the legislation. Claire, we've already seen the House's version of the mm -hmm. school funding formula, which you said increases funding across the board, but it reduces some of the funding for the poorer schools. Mm -hmm. This week, the Senate version came out. What's different? So the Senate kept um, the across the board base raises the same, but when it comes to those poorer schools, they didn't take as much out. Um, so what the big difference is how they're calculating what low income students get money. The House's version only um, funds students who qualify for free lunch. The Senate one, um, would include children in foster care and who use um, food stamps and other welfare benefits. So it expands out who qualifies for that money. So does that mean those that are in uh, school districts that have more poverty would get more or less funding? A little bit more, but it will reduce over time. So if you look at two examples, one being Indi uh, Indianapolis Public Schools, which is a very notoriously poor district, and then Zionsville Schools, which is a little more affluent, um, the Senate budget does give them a little bit more money. Um, on our website, we have a breakdown of different districts and what they'll get. Um, but the Senate gives a little bit more, and it phases, phases the money out slower over time, so they have time to adjust. What's next on the budget? So it goes to the full Senate floor um, next week for amendments. Uh, the House is about to consider a bill that would change the makeup of the State Board of Education. Been talking a lot about that. What's the latest? So a bill passed this week um, that will uh, essentially remove the current state superintendent as chair and allow the uh, board to elect from its ranks its new member. It also increases the board by two members, so it'll be 13 people instead of 11, and it also gives an appointment to the House Speaker of the House, or the Speaker of the House, and then the um, Senate Pro Tem President. So that gives not just the governor authority to appoint members of the state board. All right, thank you very much, Claire, for the updates. Thanks, Joe. Indiana athletic officials say Assembly Hall has the greatest home court advantage in college basketball, and they want to preserve that. Thanks to some donors, construction has started on the first major overhaul of the famed arena. But the renovations are more than just for fans. Coaches say top-notch facilities capture the attention of prized recruits. 
The basketball season is over and Assembly Hall is quiet. No fans, no coaches yelling from the sidelines. All the action is outside of Assembly Hall. The 18-month renovation of the historic venue got underway this week. Assembly Hall has been home to IU basketball since 1971. Three men's basketball championship teams have played here, including the last undefeated college basketball team, Bob Knight's 1976 perfect season. More than 12 million fans have filed through the doors here to watch a game, and that includes a lot of students. Assembly Hall has the nation's largest student section. It's borne out to be one of the great home court advantages in all of college basketball and college sports. Assembly Hall is a far cry from IU's first gym built in 1892, a barn that was then turned into a carpenter shop. In 1917, the men's gymnasium was built, and in 1928, the field house, now Wildermuth Gym, became home to the Hoosiers. The team then moved to Harry Gladstein Field House 11 years before Assembly Hall opened in 1971. Gray says the arena's unusual design was to accommodate events other than basketball. It was actually designed as two theater audiences facing one another. But the historic venue is showing its age, and athletic department officials decided to do a full-scale renovation rather than start over. It's a unique venue, and there are very few of those left in college basketball. A $40 million gift from alumna Cindy Simon Scott of Simon Malls is funding the project. The arena will be renamed after the family, Simon Scott Assembly Hall. Another $2 million donation from Bloomington lawyer Ken Nunn is being used to fund a Champions Plaza with new walkways, landscaping, a rain garden, and stone seating walls. This is really the focus of the whole thing. But the most noticeable difference will be in the south lobby. Plans are for a new grand entrance. The ramp system that you see here right now will be completely gone. Mm. So anything that has a ceiling over it right now will be a couple stories high in the new version. The new version will add club seating along with event space that could accommodate up to 200 people. You can kind of get a sense from this view how, how grand they might be with a staircase and escalators flanking either side. The escalators will lead to revamped concourses with larger concessions and renovated restrooms. We'll have the same number of fixtures in the renovated portion and then we're adding hundreds of new into the, into the new portion and more food options. Right now we're able to serve four lines at a time. Each of the concession stands after the renovation will be able to serve six. Inside the arena, each cushioned seat will be refurbished with added accessibility. Fans will see replays on a new video board and multimedia displays throughout the arena. But a big portion of the renovations will take place in areas fans never see. Most of this is, is from circa 1970 and is in need of some attention if it's going to be here for decades more. The renovation is worth the multi-million dollar price tag, Gray says. Not only will fans benefit, but it will help the team too. Very quickly before Bob Knight's tenure began, Assembly Hall was constructed, and you saw how it helped his recruiting. Cook Hall was built, and we, we very quickly got Cody Zeller to commit as a recruit. Um, so I do think constantly investing in your facilities helps recruiting in the, in the, in the long term. We recruited Victor Aladipo over the jackhammers and, and things like that being built uh, when the place was being built to let him hear some of those things among with other or amongst other recruits to say this is what the future sounds like. The renovation is scheduled to be complete October of 2016. The Hoosiers will still get to play the 2015 basketball season here. IU spring graduation that is scheduled in just a few weeks will move to Memorial Stadium. The national champ the, the national championship banners that you just saw there at Assembly Hall might need to be moved because of the renovations. One of those banners is the subject of our next story. We take a look back at what was making the news and our history through headlines segment. It was spring 1987. Ronald Reagan was in his second term of office. The Tower Commission presented its report on the Iran-Contra affair. Lean on Me by Club Nouveau was the number one single, and the Indiana University basketball team won its last NCAA championship title. The headline reads, Hoosier squeeze orange for number five. 
28 years ago, the Indiana Hoosiers basketball team fought through the NCAA tournament and defeated the Syracuse Orangemen for their fifth national title. Final four matchups included Indiana over UNLV, while Syracuse defeated Providence College. The Hoosiers and the Orangemen squared off in the Louisiana Superdome on Monday, March 30th. Indiana was down 73-72 to when Keith Smart's shot in the final six seconds of the game earned Indiana the victory. Smart was named the NCAA Final Four Most Outstanding Player. He is now an assistant coach for the Miami Heat. Keith Smart's last 11 minutes in, in that game may have been as well as any Indiana player ever played in championship uh, competition. He, he was just spectacular all the way down the line. He was the reason why they were within a shot of winning. Fans adorned in their freshly printed championship t-shirts took to the streets waving homemade banners, climbing Showalter Fountain, and lighting fireworks in celebration. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we follow the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters, with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Smithville Communications, serving Southern Indiana with high speed fiber gigabit internet. Smithville Fiber Gigabit Technology, tap the power. And by WTIU members. Thank you.